clinic. I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years, I used historical reenactment to bring history to life for my students in the classroom. So I wear the garb. I bring in artifacts for my students to handle, to be able to touch and make history feel real. Uh, the music would be going in the background for whatever time period I was covering. Well, I'm not in the classroom anymore. So now I'm getting a chance to put that garb that I have at home that fills a room, actually more than fills a room, and artifacts and my passion for bringing the past to life and I can apply it to a different area. So now I am kind of taking a deep dive into California history and what I've done currently with uh, my YouTube channel is, see I did a series of videos on all of the missions of California and the Asistencias spin-off missions, or what were intended to be spin-off missions, the Presidios, the fortifications designed to protect the missions, and by the way, it'd be really cool if you subscribe to the channel. Now, I, I'm following something that I stumbled across when I was researching uh, one particular mission, and that was the idea that uh, there were outlaws in California that were actually really famous that I didn't associate with California necessarily, who were visiting or hanging out around saloons that were in the missions, you know, after the missions were secularized, you know, or, you know, saloons that were nearby, and it got me curious as to whether these outlaws or these bandidos had ever crossed paths at the same time, so I started researching them. And then that just turned into researching individuals and trying to apply what I did with my mission videos to this other uh, chapter. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm headed towards Vasquez Rocks, a little bit north of uh, Los Angeles. And for me, they've always been the Star Trek rocks. Uh, because they showed up in a number of episodes. And you know, they also showed up in westerns, you know, that I watched as a kid. Well, then I realized those rocks were named for a California bandido named Tiburcio Vasquez. So I've been following his trail, and I hope you stick with me on my journey. So after the disaster that we call the Tres Pinos tragedy, Sheriff Adams, who's already had a run-in with Tiburcio Vasquez and who's been made to look like a fool because Vasquez hid in plain sight and acted as a translator while researching other, or investigating other murders, Adams is on the case. So pretty much he's going to become the personal nemesis of Vasquez. And after taking a look around Tres Pinos, he ends up going over to Fresno. And what he does is he telegraphs uh, Sheriff Roland in uh, Los Angeles. And Sheriff Roland and his deputy end up starting a manhunt because they know that Vasquez is headed towards Los Angeles. But what he's actually going to do is he's going to hide out in uh, the upper desert and so what I'm doing right now is I'm headed towards one of his hideouts. Tiburcio Vasquez didn't go straight away to Los Angeles from Tres Piños which means he kind of missed that posse that was already starting to look for him. Instead he went to a variety of places, and one of them was uh, Jim Hefner's station over at Elizabeth Lake. And this was one of his favorite hideouts. It's known to us today as Vasquez Rocks. And the reason he picked this is there is a 
whole bunch of shallow caves in here. Uh, there's all sorts of narrow places to hide in. Basically, if a manhunt was being conducted, they could lose their quarry in this place. It also was a convenient striking distance from Los Angeles. Leva finds out about the affair, basically because he catches Vasquez in bed with his wife, and Leva's told, go away, and he does. While the Manhunters barely missed Vasquez, they rode over to Delano Station in San Francisco Canyon, where Abdon Leva surrendered to Sheriffs Adams and Rowland. Vasquez chose to go in a different direction. In January of 1874, Governor Booth offered a $3,000 reward for the capture of Tiburcio Vasquez, $2,000 if he was brought back dead. The next month, those rewards were increased to $8,000 and $6,000 respectively. Alameda County Sheriff Harry Morris, known as one of the greatest of the manhunters in California was assigned specifically to track down Vasquez. Within a short time of hanging out around here, he's going to change locales. He's going to shift his attentions further east and use another rock formation as a base. The vicinity of the Cerro Gordo mines in Inyo County was pretty much the target for Vasquez and his gang. But they weren't planning to steal bullion. That's harder to transport. They figured highway robbery was good and it'd be easier to carry money and jewels. Well, Vasquez is going to make his first appearance at a place called Coyote Holes, which was a uh, stage stop uh, near Walker Pass. But this would be his hangout. From the time he started using this rock formation, which gave him a very good view of the surrounding countryside, it began to be called Robber's Roost. Vasquez and his gang continued to operate in the area and prey upon traffic and freight along the highways until army detachments from Camp Independence, about 90 miles away, showed up and attempted to hunt him down. Vasquez then fled back to Los Angeles. After Vasquez fled Robber's Roost, he came back here to Vasquez Rocks and later dropped down into Los Angeles where he stayed at the home of a man named Ioros uh, Haralamba. Most people know him today as Greek George. He had been a camel driver for the U.S. Army. There was an experiment on having a camel corps. As a matter of fact, they were supposed to have been stationed over at Fort Tejon, but that all fell apart. But Greek George ended up becoming an American citizen and he was living in Los Angeles. And Vasquez decided this was one of his hideouts. Well, while Vasquez was hiding out, he'd heard about an Italian sheep herder named Alessandro Repetto, who was living in the Eagle Rock area. And uh, he apparently had just sold a whole bunch of wool and was supposed to have, you know, just made thousands and thousands of dollars off of this. And so Vasquez approached the man. He and his gang went up to the house and Vasquez said, hey, I'm a sheep herder. I was wondering if you can give me some work. And Repetto immediately noticed, hey, there's no calluses on your hands. You know, you're not a sheep herder. And Vasquez admits, no, I'm here to rob you. And what he did is he held him for ransom, tied him to a tree, threatened to hang him, and said, um, you know, give me $10,000. Well, Repetto had already deposited 
the money in a bank and uh, that was in Los Angeles. And so Repetto's nephew had to take a check from Repetto and he went to the bank. The check was for like $10,000. And eventually what started happening is the bankers started questioning what was going on and Repetto's nephew burst into tears, told the story, and the banker immediately notified Sheriff Roland, who had pursued Vasquez earlier. And Roland got a posse together and they went chasing after Vasquez and they went into Pasadena and they went up into the San Gabriel Mountains and Vasquez got away. He eventually came here. He bounced down to Mission San Fernando and to the uh, home of Andres Pico, hung out there for a few days and eventually wound up back over at Greek George's place. Failing to catch Vasquez, Harry Morse, who was the big time manhunter, who was really famous and actually really good at his job, basically gave up, went back to Northern California. Now, it isn't the crime of robbing Repetto that ended up getting Vasquez caught. It was his fondness for women, especially women he wasn't supposed to have. Because Vasquez apparently impregnated his niece, uh, Felicita Vasquez, who was 15. Felicita's mom really was upset. There was also um, her mom's sister-in-law, uh, Consuelo Lopez, who, by the way, happened to be married to Greek George. And I believe there was Consuelo's sister, who also had a sexual relationship with Vasquez, who was also really upset. So one of these women, evidently, or maybe one of the men in this extended family, ended up going to Sheriff Roland. And uh, we know where Vasquez is. Sheriff Roland assembled a posse and arranged for them to meet at a corral near Spring and Fifth Streets in downtown Los Angeles. At 2 a.m., the posse quietly headed out town towards the home of Greek George. Sheriff Roland stayed in Los Angeles so as not to arouse the suspicion of any of Vasquez's informants. And they approached Greek George's place which was in West Hollywood, and it's been described by a number of different writers as possibly being at uh, Melrose Place, like right near the Sunset Strip, or um, lo where Laurel Canyon and Hollywood uh, Boulevards meet, or uh, Kings Road and another street that I don't remember. But there's this house that is surrounded by hedges that were five to seven feet tall and also gave a, a really good view towards Los Angeles. And what ended up happening is members of the posse hid out in a wagon. They used to pass by at a certain time of day on a regular basis. Well, they hid out in the wagon, got to a convenient spot, jumped out, lay flat on the ground, approached the house, they saw Vasquez outside. He was uh, being served by a woman, and the woman tried to tip off Vasquez. Gunfire starts. Um, Vasquez was hit several times, and he said, Hey, okay, I quit. You got me. Well, now Vasquez is taken to jail, and is a big celebrity. Uh, there's a playwright who ends up finding out about the capture, and he writes a play real fast about you know, the capture of Vasquez. And he asked to borrow Vasquez's clothes in order to, you know, make this seem more realistic. Uh, Vasquez himself offered to play himself in the play, and the sheriff's like, ah, no, you're not leaving jail. And he gave several interviews. Then he's taken up north by steamship, they take him over to San Francisco, then over to San Jose, where he's put on trial. He's getting lots of visitors. 
Everyone wants to meet this guy. He's famous. Uh, lots of women. Lots of women showing up to get uh, pictures of him, which he's autographing. Uh, he's charging like uh, $5 a picture, and that money is going towards his legal defense. Well, he's found guilty. Even though he hasn't, he's claimed he hasn't killed anybody. Some people said he killed a total of 32 people in his career. He said he didn't claim anybody. What he's being tried for is the Tres Pinos tragedy. And if someone was uh, involved in a crime that, you know, involved taking a life, you were just as guilty. So, Vasquez is found guilty. And uh, he is sentenced to be hung. And the person who's going to do it is his old nemesis, Sheriff Adams. And Vasquez had only one word to say before the lever was pulled. Pronto. Lever's pulled. He's hung. He's buried in Santa Clara Mission Cemetery. And apparently the headstone's kind of hard to find, but um, it is very distinctive. Okay, aside from having his name on it. Um, in that all the headstones in the cemetery, they're all set at the same angle. His isn't. His is off at an angle compared to the rest of the others. And... Apparently, there was someone who worked at the cemetery who said, well, yeah, that's because he was always at odds with people in life, so here it is happening again in death. Okay, so that's Tiburcio Vasquez's story. I'm going to go chase down other banditos. I hope you stick with me.